Pulling the plug on Andrew Tate like that was an unprecedented move in the history of the internet. There's never been a case of someone as famous and as influential have the rug pulled from underneath his feet that fast. The speed with which he was completely deplatformed in an overnight tells you one or two things. Either those CEOs have a WhatsApp group, and that's how such a unanimous decision came to be about, or, and I happen to lean in more towards this latter suggestion, that a higher power, name it what you will, dictates those sorts of decisions. Next morning, all we knew, Andrew Tate was completely deplatformed for, I presume the sentence read, spreading his misogynistic and sexist ideas. For, here's a rub, corrupting the youth of the world. And thus, my first reference to Socrates. And Socrates is interesting amongst other philosophers for many reasons. You think Plato, for example, you think of forms. When you think of Nietzsche, Superman comes to mind. Descartes, Cogito. But when you think of Socrates, there is no one particular axiom or philosophy that is attributed to him. Perhaps because he left no scripts, his argumentative dialogues were oral, but he had dutiful disciples who took it upon themselves to pass his witty and well-constructed arguments on to us. Socrates himself said he taught nothing, hence his famous quote, the only thing I know is that I don't know anything. But we know that is not true. We know that he rather drove the youth of Athens to think for themselves. He teased out those innate ideas in them. He, Socrates, called it the art of midwifery. Now hold that thought in mind and picture Socrates in his final scene. His order to be executed, his disciples surrounding him. You should know that unlike his fellow Athenians, Socrates did not believe in multiple gods. He believed in a high, exalted, morally just God. How interesting is that thought? So what was his crime? Corrupting the youth of Athens. He's ordered to administer the hemlock, poison, onto himself. Drink it, that is. And we see him in a famous painting by Louis David, the one behind my back. We see some of his disciples in tears, breaking down, and him holding the hemlock with one hand and raising the index of his other hand in defiance. Lots of memes were made over that painting, but to understand Socrates' final scene in depth, you would have to read Plato's last dialogue, Phaedo, which in Greek means on the soul. This final part of Plato's dialogue chronicles Socrates' final hours, but more importantly, it argues for the immortality of the soul. Basically, Socrates' disciples are crying their eyes out that the master will be no more, while the master himself is poised and well composed, drinks the hemlock, walks around the jail cell, you know, to check the effect of the poison which he's been told should cause him to first feel a numbness in his feet. And seeing his disciples break down in tears, he tells them, Young man, come on, I sent away the women for this reason, so as not to hear the cat a walling. Get a grip on yourselves, will ya? It's just the body that withers and dies. My soul is immortal. How can you be so sure, they said. Because obviously this philosopher, this emblem of rationality and thought, and the confidence and ease with which he was taking his own life, as though he was passing through a door, you know. It's baffling how assured he was in the idea that the body withers and dies, but the soul does not. And I think only sheer certainty in that thought that could have made him so unflinching and resolute as he was in those final moments of his life. And so Socrates gives four arguments to convince his pupils of the immortality of the soul. Depending on your age, I think, your experiences in life, it could take any of the four arguments to convince you that the soul is immortal, that there is more to you, young man, than the solid flesh you carry until you shuffle off this mortal coil, to quote Hamlet that the precious consciousness you glean over the decades is far too precious to simply dissolve into nothingness after you die. Any of Socrates' four arguments could convince you, potentially convince you, unless you're jahud, I don't even know how to say in English, someone who sees the truth for what it is, the truth, and still turns away from it, in defiance, in arrogance, because they're hurting, perhaps, from the inside to the point of cynicism, denial, and self-destruction. All sorts of reasons why you would willingly reject the truth. I do not believe that a sincere, rational human being would reach the final argument of Socrates IV, which happens to be the strongest, and still choose not to believe that there is a soul in them, and that that soul they carry is immortal and indestructible. And so Socrates dies that day, but only dies to live forever, to rise above all philosophers. Perhaps the price he paid for speaking out his mind, for pointing to an ultimate truth, for leading the youth of Athens to dig out those innate thoughts and ideas in them. Perhaps that midwife in work he did is what made him and his philosophy timeless. And here I go back to Andrew Tate and draw some parallels, however far-fetched and disparate the comparison might seem to you. And you have to understand that the Andrew Tate I come to defend today is not the Andrew Tate who made his fortune through any form of pornography or legal stuff. 
In fact, the reason I never addressed Andrew Tate before is specifically because the lifestyle he embodied so well, one which resonated and made sense to millions of people, particularly young men from all over the globe, that lifestyle for me was very hard to disentangle because it had so many things and elements that made sense to me, especially his take on masculinity, self-development, all in response, of course, to the feminism, lunacy, and nonsense. And at the same time, the instances and elements of what I would consider debauchery and hedonism that I understood very well but could not agree with. But that changed very quickly. I'd say right after he was deplatformed, he saw it coming, I guess. He knew the Matrix was after him, as he himself would put it. And then he suddenly made the one move that some anticipated, but the majority, I think, have not yet fully digested. To this day, he converted to Islam. And this is no regular guy, mind you. When you watch Andrew Tate in live debates or interviews, you realize that this is a highly intelligent man with sophisticated cognitive skills. The ease and immediacy with which he weaves his arguments and the witty and balanced responses are very exceptional. And many people attest to that. If anything, you would trust Joe Rogan's judgments, given the man's wealth of experiences, right? And even he said this about him. You need only watch Andrew's latest interview with one of the toughest and most argumentative interviewers out there, Piers Morgan. I have seen Morgan humiliate armies of interviewees at once, and I have never seen him so stuck vis-a-vis -vis some of Andrew's responses. So all this is just to tell you that Andrew's decision to convert to Islam is not a random act. I've no idea to what extent that decision played into his latest predicament, him being thrown in solitary confinement for months, that is. Though I heard that the decision to throw him in jail was indeed motivated by his conversion to Islam, Romania being a Christian Orthodox nation, and that Andrew was making some kind of financial contributions to it and that his conversion to Islam somehow makes the orthodoxy in Romania look bad is... Having said that, it's very hard to verify to what extent any of this is true. And perhaps, however unbiased I'll try to sound here, the fact that I am Muslim too will make it seem as though I am simply sympathizing with Tate just because he embraced my fate. But here's something to contemplate. I hope that if proven guilty, if Andrew Tate did indeed engage in human trafficking, used and abused women without consent and whatnot, I hope he gets punished for whatever it is he did. Plain and simple, but what we've seen so far is a an ugly witch hunt. And I have my reasons to believe that Andrew Tate will rot in jail for a very long time, or worse, dies under mysterious circumstances. And I hate to say that, because the power he yields is just too great. Can you imagine him preaching Islam to the millions of fans who trust him, recognize and trust his intellect and his choices? The least thing his fans would do is grab a copy of the Quran and read it, and that's all they would have to do. I'd wager most of those who do will see the truth for what it is and accept it just as Andrew did. And many are. Whoever's in power would not have any of it. Like, why barely a month or so after he announced his conversion, his house is raided and he's charged with a crime that he supposedly committed years ago? Why now? What people fail to see, and I will end on this note, that they are only making a martyr out of him. Just as Socrates was executed in hope to prevent him from further corrupting the youth of Athens, and that only made his star shine ever brighter than it perhaps would have had they not killed him, so will Andrew Tate. The more they suppress and smother his voice, the more restless and curious people will get. And the more curious people get, the more they'll be on his trail, searching, investigating, you know. And again, all it takes is an open mind and a hungry heart for truth to shine right through both. Salam.